I have made a new friend. His name is Yeshua ben Elazar ben Sirah, or ben Sirah for short. He lived in Jerusalem 2,200 years ago, and despite his and my separation across space and time, this week he and I started a friendship. Ben Sirah was a scholar, a teacher, and a scribe. His book, from which we heard today, is a collection of proverbs and teachings. It's like the book of Proverbs, but more poetic. When he wrote the book, the Hebrew Bible was still being formed. Ben Sirah fully expected his book to find a place in the Bible alongside Proverbs and Psalms and Job. Fifty years after the book was written, Ben Sirah's grandson, who was living in Egypt, translated the book from Hebrew into Greek. The tra translator saw a chance for his grandfather's work to reach a wider audience. But the book of Ben Sirah never made it into the Hebrew Bible. The book was later accepted by Christian communities as a supplement to the Hebrew Bible in a section called the Apocrypha. Ben Sirah's grandson added translator's notes, including this one. Please be lenient any place where, in spite of our efforts to do justice to the translation, our rendition comes across as inadequate. For words originally spoken in Hebrew don't have the same impact when translated into another language. Very wise words. So heeding his note, this week I spent time with the Hebrew text by Ben Sirah. I got to know his voice, his poetry. My reading, his teachings, formed a relationship across space and time. Whether true or not, I have come to believe he and I are friends. I'd like to think we are cosmic pen pals, for I received his words as a letter to me. And now, I am writing back to him. Dear Rabbi Yeshua, good morning. I know you have some questions for me, three questions, I know. I will try to answer all three. But first, thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your wisdom, for your poetry. You have helped me see friendship in a new light. Also, I'm sorry I took so long to respond. <laughs> With other friends, I'm afraid to admit I often take days to reply to a text, or sometimes months to return a phone call, and these are friends I actually enjoy talking with. But even for me, 2,200 years is a long time. <laughs> in my defense, I first heard of you only 15 years ago in seminary. But still, thank you for your patience. By now, you've heard that your book did not make it into the Bible. To answer your first question, why not? We don't know for sure. Most scholars think it's because you named yourself as the author. That was bold for your time. If you had attributed your writing to someone notable like Solomon, even though everyone would have known that Solomon didn't actually write it, then it might have had a chance. I'm sorry. Today we call that branding. <laughs> and your book did make it into other Bibles. In my religious tradition, an offshoot of Judaism based in the teachings of another rabbi named Yeshua. In my religious tradition, your book is in our Bible, which is why I've been spending so much time with your writings on friendship this week. And so to answer your second question, does anyone still read the book? Yes. Yes, rabbi. Generations upon generations upon generations later, we are still reading your beautiful book. 
I've had a hard time figuring out what to say about your words on friendship. I like the part about faithful friends. You say that faithful friends are a well-built shelter. Faithful friends are a priceless treasure. Faithful friends are the essence of life. Rabbi, if I may, let me tell you where I am today. I live in one of the richest nations on the earth. Some would say the richest nation. But money has not bought us happiness. We are a lonely people. We are not connected with each other. We are isolated from our neighbors. Psychologists have proven that spending so much time alone is making us sicker. Our bodies are not as healthy. Our minds are not as strong. Our spirits are weak. We are lost. Some of us who are lost use dangerous words to create fear and to spread hatred. Some of us who are lost use violent weapons to scare and harm and kill people. And we are sick to our stomachs. Our eyes are filled with tears. We are lost. We know that being alone is not the solution, but connecting with neighbors is getting harder and harder. For some of our rulers have misled us. They have tried to convince us that we are more different than similar, that it is not possible for us to relate to each other. And even though we at first resisted what they said, we're starting to believe them. For some of us who are lost believe that their way of being and acting in our world is the only way. They're not open to different ideas. Rabbi, we are lost. We have forgotten how to trust each other. We have forgotten how to be friends. And that is why, where I am today, your words on friendship are helpful. In particular, verse 16. Faithful friends are the essence of life, a blessing for those who know God. Rabbi, you reminded me that the word for friend in Hebrew is rooted in the word for love. The well-built shelter is rooted in love. The priceless treasure is rooted in love. The essence of life is rooted in love. Friendship is love. Rabbi, you taught me that the words essence of life are more closely translated as the balm of life. Like a balm or an ointment, friendship heals. Friendship soothes. Soothes. <laughs> and friendship is embodied. In friendship, one human being loves another human being in bodies. And that love has the power to comfort, to heal, to renew our bodies. You also reminded me that the word for life is chayim, and that chayim is a plural noun like scissors or pants, a reminder that life is not to be lived alone, but with others. As I deciphered the rest of the verse, I pieced together a new translation. It's not perfect. A faithful friend is the balm of life, and the one who knows God will reach that kind of friendship. Well, actually, my translation says, the one who fears God will reach that kind of friendship. That's actually what it says in both the Greek and the Hebrew. Our worship leaders today wisely changed the word to those who know God, and that's actually a pretty close translation. 
Rabbi, your words made me long for faithful friendship, rooted in love, grounded in bodies, bodies that need comfort, that need healing, that need renewal. But your words also confused me. What did you mean when you said that the one who fears God will reach that kind of friendship? How can my fearing God help me reach a faithful friendship? At first, to my ears, the fear of God sounded very dark and threatening. Of course, in your day, you authors of scripture were very good at dark and threatening. But then I read commentaries on your book. Yes, there are commentaries on your book, which said that fear of God was not about being afraid of God. It wasn't about an emotion at all. Fear of God was about a mindset or an approach. To fear God meant to practice piety. And in our translation, to know God through the practice of piety. It meant to follow the moral, ethical, and spiritual teachings of the faith. To live in accord, in accord with God's vision for humanity. So the one who lives in accord with the divine vision for humanity will reach a faithful friendship. Oh, I almost forgot. You also helped me see that the word for faithful is rooted in the word from which we get amen. Your repetitions of faithful friends are, faithful friends are, create a rhythmic prayer. Love, amen. Love, amen. Love, amen. Rabbi, I haven't forgotten your third and final question. Why does this book matter today? Since we are now friends, or at least I'd like to think that we are friends, I will be bold and I will try to be honest with you. I am still having a very hard time coming up with a concise, compelling message based on your 13 verses about friendship. Writing this, to say the least, has been an exercise in humility. However, as I write these words, I now see clearly that my writing has an approach similar to your non-narrative, non-linear collection of proverbs and teachings. Perhaps, dear Rabbi, you and I are closer friends than I think. But I can answer your third and final question, and I will answer, and I will tell you why this book matters today in five points. One, I am inspired that you as a writer in the second century before the Common Era took a risk and put your name on your book. You put yourself out there. You did not hide behind the name and reputation of a notable person like Solomon. And although your book did not make it into the Hebrew Bible, people around the world of many different faiths are still reading your book today. You have inspired me to take risks in my writing. Two, I am inspired that one person, your grandson, made possible our still reading your book today when he decided to translate your work into Greek. Perhaps you have heard, today we do not have a full copy of your text in Hebrew. We have about two-thirds of the book. But we do have full text in Greek, in Latin, and in Syriac. And that is because of your grandson. One person can make a lasting difference in our world. Three. I appreciate your warnings on the challenges of friendship. They speak to me. You wrote, keep your rivals at a distance and be cautiously optimistic about your friends. 
you wrote, be friendly with many, but take few into your confidence. In the same way that the Psalms give voice to our struggles and questions, your writings, your wisdom writings, help us name the challenges of friendships today. Four, I appreciate your reminder that friendship is an embodied experience and that friendship, like a balm, offers our bodies a chance for comfort, for healing, and for renewal. And five, I appreciate your teachings on the fear of God, or as I've called it, living in accord with the divine vision for humanity. Thank you for reminding us that in every effort, we are called to live morally, ethically, and spiritually in harmony with the divine. In every effort and in every relationship, we are called to live in love. Yesterday, Rabbi, in our nation, someone tried to kill our former president. Later in the day, I allowed my body to feel the weight of that cruel act of violence. I found there were tears in my eyes. I don't know how much you know about this former president. I can tell you never in my life did I ever imagine I would cry for this man. Were they tears of grief? No. Were they tears of anger? No. They were, dare I say it, tears of compassion. The tears reminded me every human life is sacred. All life is sacred. Your book matters, Rabbi, because it opens our hearts to the mysteries of the divine. Thank you. Love, amen. Love, amen. Love, amen.